Yeah, so today we're going to talk about Mad Dog No Good. Now, you got to say his name like that. Now, that's how you got to say his name because back in the day, people would come up in the place, everybody being there, you know, playing poker, shooting pool and all that, drinking. And all of a sudden, somebody busts through the front door. Mad Dogs are coming. Who you say coming? Mad Dog. Mad Dog No Good. And everybody just sit up straight, put the hat, their money hat, their jewelry. You know, if they with their lady, they push her away. Cause when Mad Dog would come, <laughs> Mad Dog wanted a piece of everything. Everything that went on in his town, he wanted a piece of it. And he even would travel around towns. Sometimes if he feeling a little short and he needed a couple of extra little dollars, he'd go find it. Now, back in this time, man, you know, these are the days when people was bootlegging. Now, for y'all that don't know, bootlegging is when um, America had banned liquor. Now, to this day, you have people that talk about, you know, how terrible liquor is. I done lost family members from liquor. Like, you know, y'all probably had too. Liquor is worse than, <laughs> I ain't going to say it's worse than some other stuff out there, but it's worse because how available it is and there's nobody to check you on it you know but anyway they banned the stuff so people would do anything to get their hands on it so they was running liquor from state to state just like folks run dope now look don't let the don't let the little hype fool you know mad dog was you know as you can see on on the picture up there he wasn't big at all boy i'm talking about he was too small to even be called small he was too short to be called short but man, he did not let that stop him. And it's almost like a, it's almost, if he wasn't such a criminal, it'd almost be like the number one inspirational tale of all time. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell y'all how it went from the beginning. Now look, I don't mind coming on here and doing this stuff for y'all, but the only thing I ask is press the like button. The like button is free. I'm not gonna ask you to hit the cash app. I'm not going to ask you to hit the PayPal. All I'm asking is hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. If you want to, you ain't even got to subscribe. You ain't even got to hit the notification bell. Just hit the like button. That's the only thing I ask. All right? That's easy. Now, Mad Dog came up in Mississippi on a cotton plantation in the early... Um, he was, you know, he's coming through his teenage years, the early 1900s, so... Probably was born around 1890, 1885, somewhere around that time. And, you know, things at this point was horrible, boy. You know, for black folks, it was real bad. Now, you got some people that talk about how it was black people living good during this time somewhere and all that. But it wasn't here. Right? It wasn't Mad Dog family. So, you know, they grew up during this time. Now, his parents were sharecroppers. And um, they did. I'm talking about back-breaking labor, man. Now, a sharecropper, you weren't a slave, but you were still staying on the slave owner's plantation. So after slavery, it was like, well, dang, where we go? So the slave owners were like, all right, y'all can stay here. Just keep doing what you've been doing. And uh, the money you make, you know, the, the stuff you farm or whatever, give to me, and I'll pay you a little something. And then you pay me back rent. But, of course, you know, they was taking whatever they wanted to take. And uh, wasn't nothing they could do about it. So, he saw his parents work like that. Now, back in these times, when you was born with a deformity, you know, people looked at you funny. Most of the time, man, people would, you know, do something to the child or they would get the child away. But his mama and daddy said that they was going to stick by this child, even though he was kind of a burden to him. You know, with the uh, issues he had growing up and stuff, but they decided to go ahead and stick it out. And of course, you know, the the the, the people, who the bosses, looked at him like, you know, this child's useless. He's not gonna be able to grow up and work and all that. But the mom and daddy did what they had to do to look out for their baby. Now, so right off the jump, Mad Dog was like different. You know, it was he the odds were stacked on him worse than pretty much anybody walking around. So, you know, he, he grew up with his parents. They was teaching him everything they could. He was able to do some little things around. You know, he wasn't able to do what the other kids his age could do. Because, look, at this time, it's rumored that during slavery times, you had three-year-olds taking food out to the fields. 
and even I've heard cooking the food, but I know for a fact that they was, you know, at least taking the food out to the fields. So any of y'all who have three-year-old children or got a brother or sister that's three, you know your sibling can't walk from the kitchen to, they, <laughs> to the kitchen table, from the stove to the table without dropping something. And these kids was walking from the kitchen all the way out to the fields. So they just show you the difference in the, the mindset and the, and the lifestyle at the time. So, you know, of course, you got the sun beating down on you. You know, um, you know your clothing not always the best. Your shoes, holes in them if you even got them. But, you know, they put up with it. They, that's all they knew. So it, I guess to them it was, you know, like, yeah, they want it better. But at the same time, it was all they knew generation after generation so you know that kind of wore down on a lot of people where they didn't really try to do more they just accepted what they had even to this day man like i grew up in chicago and when i go back up there i'd be like dang man why, why would anybody want to raise their kids here and i ain't trying to knock nobody who have to do that because if that's all you can afford to do that's all that's been presented to you then that's what it is. So it's the same thing with mad dog parents. It was all they knew. It was all that was presented to them. They didn't know. They didn't have like we have Instagram and all that where we can go and see people taking jets and doing all these things that, you know, we didn't even know was possible. <laughs> you know, people going to different cities just to try a restaurant out and go back home. Like, you know, that's something that wasn't, it wasn't, you know, they didn't see that. They didn't know that. You know, so anyway, um, as he got older, he actually became real handy around the farm, around the plantation, because what he would do was he would uh, like work out little deals. So different families and, you know, and black folks, they had their beefs with each other, too, as long as they, like, just as well as they had it with the, the masses and stuff. Because, you know, they always put division between um, the people on the bottom. So, you know, they had a list of a mad dog would go and put together little side deals. And, you know, hey, I will trade you this if you trade that. And he'd be like a third party between, you know, different folks who was beefing here, come and find somewhere where they could meet in between. Like he was always had his hands in something. He always was trying to work out a deal, trying to make friends out of somebody. I don't know how he learned that skill. I don't know who taught it to him. Maybe his parents did, but you know, he just really understood how to like work people. So, you know, it showed the genius kind of level of intellect he had. But hey man, I might be, you know, shocked in a mug. But, hey, I could at least, my, my body's short, but my brain ain't big. You know, my body might only be, you know, two feet tall, but my brain the same size as everybody else's. So, he put that brain to good use, man. Now, as he was learning to navigate this stuff, eventually, he learned that he needed to have, you know, that... Sometimes you got to get your hands dirty. You know, everything can't always be clean. You know, sometimes things get so jacked up that the only thing that can fix it is something else jacked up. So this is where he learned to, um, like, he needed him some henchmen. He needed him some, some little, some, uh, what you call the guy? Yeah, a henchman that going, they do all of your bidding for you, man. Go and rough somebody up if they needed to. So, you know, that's what he started doing. And before you know it, one time, one day he went to the city with his um, with his pops. He was about maybe 10 years old at this time. And he saw some guys from up north. These was mafia guys who was coming down to the south to work out little deals and stuff. They had to come down there to, you know, move stuff around, get stuff done. And would even try to, like, um, have some of their influence down there. So when he seen these guys, man, dressed up in... You know, these suits and stuff. Because, you know, he saw little suits, but he didn't see suits like these, you know. All the way tailored up and all, you know, just, you know, they had them over-the-top suits, man. Just stuff that was, you know, just anyway. So, when he seen all that, he was like, that's the life I want to live. But, you know, of course, he saw that this was white folks, you know. This wasn't, um, you know, folk like him. So, he, you know, he knew it would be hard. But, hey, man, like I said, if he wasn't no criminal, this would be the greatest inspiration story ever. 
He said, I ain't gonna stop until I get me one of them suits. So every chance he would get, he would try to get to the city. Every time somebody was taking a ride in the town, whatever, he would try to do whatever he could to get out there to that city and see those guys and see the way they was moving. So, you know, like I said, they, they get down, they take the train over there. And when they came down to these country towns, a lot of times they would get rejected. You know, them uh, country folk weren't finna let no big city folk come down there and tell them how to run their stuff. But they were starting to learn something if the, if the um, city guys came with respect. As long as they came with respect and showed them the way they was doing things, every now and then some crooked person down there in the south would, uh, you know, let them teach them some of their ways. So, uh, Mad Dog did everything he could to watch and study those guys. Even if it was only five minutes, he'll take that five minutes and just and write it down in his mind. Because, you know, he ain't know how to write or read or nothing. But he'll write it down on his mind and uh, say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. Yeah, I like the way they did that, this and that. And he was really picking up on it. And he was adding this to his little, his little gang, his little set he had you know back on the plantation now mad dog was actually making more money than his parents you know now we ain't talking about no you know we ain't talking about no tossing money up in the air you know you talking about this a time when people making like pennies a day man you know but he was making more pennies than his parents so just like today when you see these boys out there in the street and start looking down on their parents he was doing the same thing. And this during the era where people ain't play that, man. You know, you didn't disrespect my man Daddy. But Mad Dog, he'd play along, you know, go along to get along with him. But he didn't have respect for his parents because he looked at them like they were suckers. He felt like they should have been trying to do something to make some extra money. And how come him, as a little kid, is able to figure out how to make extra dough, especially with his, um, you know, physical situation? So, now he was sneaking out the house at night. You know, now he was getting, um, his, his little crew was, crew was getting violent. Like, uh, he even had his crew, you know, intermingling with the, um, with the white boys doing little, little side deals and stuff like that. So, he was playing a real dangerous game, man. You know, he playing a butt. He was always able to get away with it because... It was something about his size, and he just had like this little charm about him, where everybody just liked him. <laughs> and they, and I guess subconsciously, it's like they really didn't knock him for doing what he was doing because they understood that what else was he gonna do? <laughs> you know, like he had to do. You know, he had to, he had to make some moves, man. He had to try some stuff out. So that really worked in his benefit. Now, when he was a teenager, at this point, he really was kind of, like, just not feeling his parents, man. And, uh, you know, he he'd give them a little piece of the money he made. And they thought that he was making it from, you know, just running around doing little errands, and, you know, and things of that nature. And he never, like, completely hipped them to all the money he would make. You know, he'd give them a little piece but he would never let them know how that he was making more than them. So, like, you know, if he made 10 cents, he'd give them, like, one or two. You know, black folks at this time, a lot of them would, was so, like, just bent on trying to do the right thing. Always, because it's like the the, the masters was, would teach them to always do right, even though they didn't do right themselves. Now, in my personal belief, I believe part of the reason... Why black folk was able to come up and get to the point where we at today where we can um, own things and we can handle business and take care of stuff and do some great things in life. Me, myself, I believe it's because a lot of our, you know, grandparents and great, great grandparents held true to what's right and wrong. You know, now not a lot of people didn't and all that, but, you know, I, I can say in my family, man, uh, my grandparents did what was right. You know, my great grandparents, you know, for the most part, as far as I know, everybody pretty much did what was right, man. They they stood on principle. That don't mean they didn't sin. That don't mean they didn't this or that. But, you know, they held down and stayed with their families, you know. 
And I think that carries on to generation after generation, man. Even to this day, you know, I stick with my family. I take care of my kids because, you know, that's all I ever saw. I didn't see nothing else. That's what I saw with my mama and daddy. They, you know, my daddy, he was there. My mama was there. Um, my granddaddy, my uh, great-granddaddy, at least. Let me see. One, one of them, he was there. What's my other great granddad? He was there, yeah. How many great granddaddies you got? Cause you got four granddaddies. Dang, you got eight great granddaddies. Is that right? No, that can't be right. No, that's wrong. You always got four grandparents, right? It's always four. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's always four couples. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to do a little. I'm gonna have to do a little tree, man. That I'm, now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, but you know. I come from that type of family, so that's all I know. Now, I told you he played it cool, but he really had like a hate in his heart for the people that, you know, just went out there and worked them fields all day. And uh, especially he also, when people like would feel sorry for him when they go to church or something, and, and people would be feeling sorry for him because of his height and all that, he really hated that, man, because... He felt like he appreciated his height because he felt like if he would have been regular, he'd have been out there working the fields with everybody else. He felt like it was his height which separated him and made him have to use his head and come up with different ways. So in a way, he, you know, and it's, it's messed up with, uh, with all them years and generations of, uh, what's it called, when people, oppression, all them years of oppression kind of wore down on him to where he actually was like looking up to the white folks. He was looking at them like they were smart, like they was, you know, they was real. They was really getting over. Now, he didn't love them. I'm not saying he loved me. You know, he had hate for <laughs> he had hate for them too. But at the same time, he liked that they hustled. So, you know, he wasn't. Um, I don't think he was willing to. Like, he wasn't finna, you know, he did have some pride in, you know, these is my people. But at the same time, he was going to do what he had to do to get that money. Because he realized that that's all everything was about. In America, in Mississippi, as far as he knew, all he knew was the folks with money lived the good life. And the folks without it lived the bad life. And it's just that simple. So... Now, at this time, you talking about now we around the 19, you know, we coming up in his 20s. And he just steadily coming up. You know, at this point, he had moved, you know, away from his parents. And he was, um, had him a little safe houses set up because he was getting into some serious crimes. Now, he was getting into robberies. He was getting into, uh, uh, what's it called? Like, uh, they used to do a lot of running numbers. You know, he was running numbers. He was doing, uh robberies what else he was doing you know drugs one drugs one a thing like that at that time they had marijuana though he was in doing marijuana and uh you know he was just starting up his little empire so he always stayed on the move you know he knew he was easy to identify so he would stay on the move and he would have him like a network of women that would carry him around like he was they like he was their child. So, you know, they'd put a blanket over him and, and they'd get on a horse carriage or whatever. You know, later on they did the same thing when they started getting the little cars, the Model T's and all that. And they'd just be moving around, you know, with him under the blankets, with him in a little bassinet and everything, like he was a baby, man, or a little kid or whatever. And that's how they uh and that's how he kept himself on the low. You know, he was smart enough to know that he had to, you know, not be all out in the front. Because he seen the guy. This is what this is when he really understood, you know, how to, the difference between, like, the, the, the smart criminals, the ones who were successful, and the ones who was dummies. The ones who might have a little something for a minute, but they'd be gone and never get the chance to spin it. So, it was this one guy, and he was real... Real rambunctious, man, like a real loud mouth, run up on folk, you know, pop them upside the head, you know, with no fear, 
didn't matter if he was the police, but he's a white guy now. So, you know, he say he's like one of the mafia guys. So he go to town and he'll see the little bars. He'll always see this guy cussing somebody out, knocking somebody out, you know, outright taking something from somebody if he wanted it, slapping women around, everything, man. And um, he always realized just how much attention this guy got everywhere he went. And it was to the point where people would do deals with him, but not because they wanted to. They would do deals with him out of fear. And he would hear the little whispers of people saying, one day somebody going to give, you know, give him what's, what's, uh, what he deserved or whatever. So, you know, eventually the guy got <laughs> what he deserved. And it was... Uh, it was so much lead that uh, so much lead that 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 was with him. It it was like you know you know how they say close uh, close cash <laughs> like it was closed it was closed locked sealed like ain't nobody want to look up in there <laughs> that's how it was. So when he seen what happened to him, he said, "Yeah, that's why I gotta make sure." I stay low key. So that's what he did. He kept everything on the low. And uh, even if it was slow money, slow money better than no money. So he'd take a little piece here, a little piece there, and put it all together. And you got a nice little, um, a nice little empire or whatever. Now, during the 1920s, you know, at this point, everything was going smooth. You know, he actually... You know, even though his parents, he couldn't stand him, you know, growing up, he got a little wiser. And, you know, he'd go and break him off a little something and make sure his parents ain't have to work for nobody. And they even became like um, like landowners. It would, uh, you know, put sharecroppers on their land and would treat them decent, man. So, you know, it was it was some little good moments in there. Like, you know, Mad Dog was very cold, but as he got older, you know, he was able to understand that everybody wasn't, everybody just wasn't made out for this type of life he was in. He seen the way the people that came up with him would come and go. How they would all, uh, you know, drink themselves till they out of there, or they would, you know, uh, you know, I'm trying to be careful with the words I use, or just the, the, the he see how rough they looked over the years. He'll see how they, it just, the lifestyle just beat them down. You know, and it beat him down too in a way, but you know, he never overindulged because he had taught himself such discipline from the time he was a kid. So, you know, he'd do some stuff, but he never went so sideways to where he couldn't rein himself back in. But um his little you know, his little crew, man, he just would go through guys, man. And a guy would, you know, either go out and do something stupid and lose his life or whatever. And uh, it would be another five guys ready to take his spot. So, you know, he started understanding that is everybody different. And, uh, you know, so now his parents, he didn't look down on them so much. He even apologized to him. And, uh, like I say, had him, gave him a little piece of land. Now, his parents... At this point, I'm sure they had an idea of what he was doing, but I think that all them years of um, out there in them fields, even his mama was, you know, was such a prideful woman and daddy a prideful man. I do believe that at this point, they went on and took that help. They probably knew the money was crooked and uh, all that, and I'm sure they knew, you know, like, hey, what you do for a living, son? Well, you know, like, I'm sure they knew that, but. But at this point, man, uh, hey, you know, 30 years out there in them fields, 40, 50 years. So let me see, because if he was about, at this time, he about 30. So that would have had them at about, you know, back then you had kids pretty early. So, you know, that probably put them at at least, you know, 46 to 50. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure that they uh all them years of working in them fields, 40 some years, whatever, 40, 30 for some years, they was ready to, uh, they was ready for some help. So, with this uh, prohibition came, this was the time when people was really making a killing, man. And now you had automobiles, you had cars was more, uh, what you call it, like effective. They was 
more gas stations and stuff now you could travel further and quicker you know um, you didn't have to rely on traveling on the train so you could move through the night in your car kind of like on your own speed at your own pace or whatever so now the stuff was coming in through new york he actually got you know got cut in with the um, mafia guys so you know because at this time the mafia was kind of like really coming into itself so at the early 1900s they was getting into america and they had to look but it wasn't as um like it wasn't as pronounced as it was by the time you know prohibition hit at this point this one like it was the mafia like we see in the movies you know the tommy gun mafia man so he um actually got in good with them because the white people hated the italian people too so since, you know, it was like, hey, man, we both hate it. So let's stick it to them and, and really hit them where it hurt. So, you know, and it, you don't hear about this a lot because the Italians was real racist against the blacks, too. You know, but he was able, like I say, he had that charm about him where everybody liked him. And the Italians would work with black people long as, you know, they are. Uh, as long as they was helping them make money, they will work with them. You know, shoot. as long as they're helping them make money, they work with him. So his connections was getting bigger. His expertise in different types of crimes was getting bigger. He was loan sharking people. You know, a loan shark, man, that's one of the worst things it is, boy. You know, they give desperate people, or like, okay, they'd take somebody real desperate, right? Give them $50. No one. This guy ain't never made $50 in, it's like, knowing this guy ain't never had that much. I'm talking about at that time. Let's make, I'll make it modern to make it a little more relatable. A loan shark could get somebody like $1,000, like a crackhead, knowing that a crackhead ain't never got more than $10, $20 in their pocket, because as soon as they get $10, $20, they going to go buy some crack, you know? So they ain't never got no more than $10, 20 so they give them a five hundred, they give them a thousand or whatever, knowing they ain't gonna be able to pay it back. Now, when they not able to pay it back, they gonna come and put a hurting on them. Some of them gonna go straight to the hurting. Some of them might give them, a, you know, scare them a little bit first, but eventually, they gonna put a hurting on them and have him paying them every time they see him. They gonna shake him down, see what he got, or they gonna have him do cause what they really want. In a lot of cases, is for this person to be like owe them one. So now, since he owe, one, really he owed them a thousand. <laughs> so since he owed them a thousand, every time they got a stupid dummy mission, hey man, go get old, uh, go get old uh, Cracky Joe, man. So they go get old Cracky Joe. Hey man, we got this stuff. We want you to carry it over here and deliver it right there. And he like, wait, that's I gotta go cross the. That's right next to the police station. Okay, and. <laughs> okay, whatever. Yeah, you're right. It is. Now, go deliver it. Wait, but that's through um, that's through them territory where them young boys be robbing everybody. Oh uh, yeah, that's exactly where it is. Okay, now go deliver. It. So that's what it's really all about. Is they need somebody to send on them dummy missions, man. And uh, so yeah, he was getting into loan sharking on. Uh, uh, now eventually, and I think this was pretty much his downfall. But, you know, it was his downfall, and I'm not, and it was kind of out of character for him. And he did try his best to, like, you know, still stay under, under low key. But, hey, man, you know, after so long, man, that stuff started getting to your head. You start, you know, you moving and grooving and doing things so good for so long. After a while, you know, you start getting a little sloppy, man. You know, you start feeling yourself a little bit. It's only natural, especially if you the boss. See, one thing the mafia had to help keep people in check was they have a um, like multiple bosses, and the bosses would have to just be in line with the bosses back in Sicily, and you had different bosses in um, in the cities where they was at, and they'd do meetings and they had sit downs and they had. You know, capos, that's like the underbosses and all that stuff. So, it was a system in place to stop people from just running wild. 
Now, a lot of times when people ran wild, they always ended up, you know, axed out. So, we're going to have to do a part two because the, the stuff that happened in the club, like, it's going to take me probably about an hour to get through a lot of that. And, um, yeah, so I'm probably going to do a part two. So, you know, if you made it this far, then... You, I'm going to add you to the prayer list. <laughs> yeah, well, please, man. I, I please hope that y'all hit that like button, man. That ain't too much to get dang guys right. That's all I ask. Hit the like button, man. Now, Mad Dog, no good. He was vicious. He was vicious, man. Like, now, don't, you know, I said he was real cunning and real smart, but he was vicious, too. That's the, the reason why people followed him is because yeah he couldn't do the dirty work but he was stupid enough to go try he'd be scared to death and he'd know that you know he finna (laughs) that you know he couldn't even beat up the average little girl but you know he knew that he had to give it a shot so one day somebody was bullying him because he they owed him some money now you know he showed up and asked for his money and they uh told him to hit kick bricks you know, hit the road. Now, he turned like he was finna go kick bricks. And they turned to go on back to what they was doing. And he came back and lunged at him like Chucky or something, man. Bit his kneecap and ripped his kneecap right. Oh, man, I ain't mean to say all that. <laughs> but he uh, bit him in the kneecap and he ripped it right on off. So, after that day right there, they said, okay. This little man crazy. <laughs> One time, you know, it was some boys who uh, were stealing from the old ladies. Now, you know, Mad Dog was like, hey, y'all can do y'all crimes, whatever, but you don't do no crimes in here unless you're going to give me a piece because y'all are going to mess it up and get it too hot out here. So now they weren't trying to hit that. they like, we ain't, first of all, we don't care if it get too hot, and we sure ain't going to bring you in on it, pig. Now, and this was like four, five guys, and they even had pistols and y'all, right? So they had a little a little barn where they'd meet up and play cards, and the women be in there, and they'd be playing music and all that stuff. So he walked up in the barn <laughs> with a match in one hand and a stick of dynamite <laughs> in the other hand. And he held the little fuse to the dynamite to the match, and he said, if y'all don't give me my money, I want all that money on the table y'all got right now. I blow every single one of us in here from home to heaven. And I'm ready to go because I'm tired of walking around, struggling, being shot anyway. So I will blow this whole place up. (laughs) And they said he didn't blink. They said he didn't crack a smile. They said his face didn't move. And they came and dropped that money all right in front of him. He had his boy come in and pick it up. And after that, Mad Dog has to worry about nobody else. <laughs> All right? He has to worry about nobody else. So, uh, yeah, yeah. They say he let that fuse, man, and the fuse was going to shh. The fuse was coming all down. And them folk ran and got that money and threw that money in front of him. And he said he put that fuse out. It was just... They say he was just on the uh, fit that pop. So, yeah, man, uh, Mad Dog, you know, he didn't have to worry about nobody else after that, man. Now, everybody would come to his club, and it was a little jerk joint, man, a little speakeasy. So the speakeasy was like a little hidden club where people would come and drink and party and all that and, uh, you know, keep it on the low. So... He had him a little spot, you know, they had a, a little old house, and they flipped it around, and uh, they had to park their cars back off in the woods. They, they had some corn, like the, the fields, the long grass or whatever, they had the grass all growed up all high. And since the grass was growed up so high, you couldn't see it when you, you couldn't see the cars or nothing, you know, unless you drove on back there. So they had parked their cars or they, they wagons or they horses, whatever they had, you know, at that time. And they, um, uh, come on in there and party. 
Now, he wasn't the only black guy running stuff. It was other, you know, things was getting bigger. Things were getting faster, and there was other people doing it. But wasn't nobody doing it like he was doing it. Now, he stayed on the low. But what was happening was his, his, uh, the people under him and all the other, they getting all the credit. They getting all the credit for the club. They getting all the credit for, you know, gift sticking it back to the man. They getting all the credit for, you know, the, the nice cars and the nice suits. And, and he like, dang, I'm putting in all this work. And I got to stay up here hidden on the top floor and look down at the party. So he said, man, skip it. He went and got his nicest suit. And he went down there and he started party. He had the girls come sit around him. He had them bring him something to drink. And, uh, you know, he had a couple bodyguards standing there waiting for him to snap his fingers and snap somebody <laughs> if they had to. And uh, he just got tired of, you know, sitting around and, uh, you know, not, not, not getting the chance to, you know, get the benefits of uh, his, the, what's the fruits of his labor, as they say. But like I say, this was his downfall, man. This is what really, you know, messed him up, man. If he could have kept it quiet, you know, he probably would have lived me a little, man. Somebody like him might live all their days out. But now, when he did show himself, this new guy came into town a couple months later. Now, this new guy was from New York. And this guy went from New York to Chicago, and he spread a lot of his little, um, you know, his little, his black guy too. He spread a lot of his stuff in Chicago, and then the next step from there, Mississippi. So he, you know, he heading his way on down. He hit up Mississippi. Now when he got to Mississippi, man, he came down there, and I'm talking about they had guns, they had. Uh, you know, so now this was they we getting on into the we getting on into the thirties now. Now in the thirties you did start seeing like some um you did start seeing drugs. You had the opium and of course you had the uh, cannabis and stuff and all that. So with the opium and can you even had um the amphetamines and stuff at this time, man. So he was bringing in the drugs. Now this is when People really was getting hooked, you know, like they had a liquor who hooked some people, this or that. But a lot of people didn't like, you know, you know, that, that strong. Because, like, even when, you know, like, a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like liquor and the, and the uh, you know, they don't like all that. So, but when he brought that other stuff in, you know, that hard drug, it hit hard, but it's like you can shake it, you know, like if you drink. You done for the night. You got to go to sleep and wake up and then probably going to feel bad and everything. But this other stuff, you know, you be tore up for a minute, but you can come on out of it. You know, you can come on and it usually make you feel like, like you know, you're getting high. So you feel higher. You ain't feeling necessarily lower. And what black folk were going through at this time, they weren't trying to feel lower. <laughs> they wanted to feel better. You know, they... They like, yeah, they, we can't get no, we can't get no lower. You know, we are, we, we need something to bring us up. So, you know, he had to hook up on this stuff, and uh, Mad Dog just couldn't compete with that man. Like, that's just something, you know, you can't compete. You know, he just didn't have those hookups, man. He tried to, you know, figure out where the guy was getting the stuff and all that and this, but nobody was talking because they had it so sweet with the guy. They weren't finna mess it up, you know, messing with the little mad dog, some country boy. I ain't finna, they ain't finna jeopardize what they got. He even went up to New York, you know, um, did some looking around and asking around. He, you know, and when he finally got a chance to meet up with the guy, you know, the guy offered him to come in, and uh, mad dog wasn't used to being up under no party. So Mad Dog was like, no, nah, if you're going to sail down here in my town, you're going to have to, you know, you can come up under me, but I'm not going to come up under you in my own town. So they had to agree to disagree, and uh, one of them put the word out. Now, I feel like, I ain't going to lie, I feel like Mad Dog was jealous. I feel like Mad Dog was jealous of this guy because this guy, was uh um, you know he from up north he was uh educated he knew how to read you know he knew how he talked um uh, 
you know, it just was, you know, I felt like Mad Dog might have been a little jealous of him. And then on top of that, he had a better product and was making more money. You know, and I, I think that uh, Mad Dog just didn't like that. I think if he would have not got his feelings in it, he would have went up under the guy and made that money. Because he would have made more money with him, even up under him, he would have made more than he was making on his own. So he was going to like double or triple his net worth. So, you know, I think that uh, Mad Dog, that from what I understand, the rest of this stuff, he would have went along with that. But the fact that he didn't go along with it, in my opinion, I think that showed a level of jealousy. Okay, and that will be it for today's episode. I'll be back. Yeah, I know I'll be back. Shoot, where else I'm going to go? <laughs>